how we spend our moments is how we spend our, how we live our days. And how we spend our days is how we live our lives. So, how we spend our moments, like these, is how we live our days, and how we live our days, how we spend our days, is how we live our lives. Let me, let me begin with a thought experiment. Let's play a thought experiment together. Imagine you've come out of a doctor's office and she has diagnosed you and you've got the depressing news that you have only three weeks to live. <coughs> and the question is in your mind, now how am I going to live these three weeks? So certainly I'm not going to go and get an executive MBA now, right? Nor will I take a course, a crash course in public speaking, right? Nor will I suck up to my boss so that I can get the next promotion. And nor should I be picking up a quarrel with my neighbor as is my habit. So this, actually, the idea is to focus our minds as what we do, what we do in the next three weeks is how we want to live our lives. Every day we spend the next three days is every day. I mean, we all are under a sentence of death. So the purpose of this game really is to remind ourselves that we treat our lives very casually as time pass. We sleepwalk through our life. Or we are good, we listen to our mother and father and we study hard we get good marks, and then we get into a good college like the students who are here today. Or, and then when we are in college, again we take safe subjects, so we get good marks. And then, so that we get a good job, and so we get a good job. And at the job, we work hard, and we get promoted and we climb ladders. We get a nice house, then we get a bigger house. We have children, we send the children to good schools. And somewhere in midlife, in, the, in our 40s, we ask ourselves, is this what life was all about? So, you know, it, re it really brings up again like the thought experiment we play. It raises the question of what is, why are we living, what's the purpose of it all? And the purpose is the purpose that many of us wish to seek. Because we are not like Mozart. Mozart, at the age of three, knew he was a musical genius. Luckily, his father <laughs> had given him a violin when he was three. And he picked it up. And then he also discovered that he had perfect pitch. Meaning, if he heard a tune, he could immediately repeat it. Well, he, so he lived his life with that purpose, creating 625 works, great works of music. And 
until the age of 31 when he died. <coughs> well, <coughs> in our case, we, we don't know what is our purpose, the way Mozart knew. And so, you know, we, we feel a bit guilty <coughs> that we don't know what is our purpose. But the fact is, it's perfectly all right not to know one's purpose. The fact people will say, oh, you have to find yourself. No. You have to create yourself. There is no God-given purpose. Or there is no God-given you who has a certain purpose. You create your purpose. And, and also, <clears throat> one shouldn't feel too guilty because the other, the opposite of this is those who plan their lives. Who plan their life? I mean, one young man came for an interview to me and he, I said, do you have, after we talked, I said, do you have any questions? And he said, yeah, what is your retirement plan? I said, you're 22 and you're worried about retirement today? So there is a habit in some of us to over plan your life. And there's not enough room for spontaneity. And as they say, I don't know, I think Seneca said it, while I was planning, life passed me by. So that's the other problem in this. But it is a duty, duty of parents, duty of teachers to help someone discover what they like, what their purpose is. And <clears throat> so, to end this thought experiment, let's go next step. You're about to die, right? So what will be the last words in your last breath that you will want to utter? Think about that. What will you, what's the last thing you will say? You could say, I have lived. How about that? I have lived. Uh, and what a wonderful thing it was. You could say, like everybody else, you could, you know, you the human tendency is to really be pro to, to project forward. That's why we're always thinking, now what am I going to have for lunch today? You know, we're always thinking ahead. We're not thinking at this moment. And so, um, your last words, what's next? That's a nice last word, what's next? Anyway, <clears throat> let me leave this as homework, especially for the kids here. You've got a lot of time now, but play this experiment with yourself and figure out what is it you'll do in the next three weeks if you have only three weeks to live and what will you say in your last breath if you have one breath left to live. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to try and tell you three stories. If there's no time, at least two will, will do. And the stories are really meant to stimulate this idea. The idea that what, what is it that we should be uh, thinking about, what or looking for a purpose, or how to find a purpose, and what it is to live with a purpose, and what it is not to live with a purpose. <clears throat> The three stories I will tell are my own. 
not because I'm more important than you, but just the fact that I know myself, meaning one person's life honestly captured is the only true data of history that we have. And by the way, this is time for a short commercial break. I have a book coming out in October, which is a memoir, the story of my life, which is called Another Sort of Freedom. What is that other sort of freedom? I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that question. Read the book and you'll find <laughs> out. Um, <clears throat> So one will be my story. The second will be the story of my mentor who came to work in my company as an assistant security guard. He was not a graduate, metric pass, from a village in Akola district in Maharashtra. This was his first visit to Bombay, his first job. And he was such a Dehati that he would pronounce the name of our company Proctor and Gamble because his name was Gamble. <laughs> and the third story, if we have time, is the story called The Mouse Merchant. A story from the 12th. That first two are true stories. Second one is a fiction, fictional story from the 12th century text called Sanskrit text called Katha Sarit Sagara, Ocean of Stories. And it's an inspiring story for the age of startups. And since we are in the age of startups today, and especially for young, for you people, young people, um, I think you'll find it of interest. Okay, so begin with my story. My first memory is that when I was four and a half years old, I, had, I was in kindergarten in Lahore, in model town Lahore, which is of course now in Pakistan, because I'm a refugee. And I came home with a report card, and my mother was waiting at the door, and she saw me you know, waving this green piece of paper. And she looked at me and she asked me, did you stand first? And my father was close by, nearby her, and he said to her, that was the wrong question. Ask him what he likes about school. Does he like to draw? <coughs> Does he like to read, and the, who are his friends, and there's other things you should ask him. And so, you know, I came, I come from a middle class Punjabi family, and my mother was suffering from the usual Punjabi middle class anxieties, actually every Indian middle class anxiety, meaning this boy will have to go, will have to make a living one day. And so he better do well in studies. My father was reflecting an opposite opinion, which was not making a living, but making a life. That is where the title of this talk is the difference between making a living and making a life. Now, all of us, most of us, unless we are very wealthy, have to make a living. But we forget that we also have to make a life. So that's really the purpose of this talk. And so I grew up in this middle class family. Actually, the year was 1947. It was March when this event, came. this memory is, is there. After partition, we fled for our lives like uh, 10 million other uh, Indians, and I grew up in, in free India, post-partition India, and um, 
this theme of making a living and making a life stay because my mother kept reminding me whichever class I was going to that you better study hard and do well. So out from, from when I was 16 and a half, 17 almost, uh, I had the unbelievable good fortune of getting a scholarship to go to Harvard. And I still remember it was Palom Airport in Delhi. I was to take an Air India flight and um, my mother's in tears saying goodbye and then she says, remember you have to make a living, study something useful at Harvard. When you come back, she says, why don't you be like your father? He's an engineer, and then you'll get a job. So she knew that. Anyway, there I fly off to Harvard, and the very first day, I um, see the catalog of courses, and my, I, my mind is blown by the courses that were available. And I complete, I forgot my mother's advice immediately. I took, for the first two years, I took courses in Greek tragedy, the Russian novel, Renaissance painting, Beethoven, the music. And then I came home for the summer and for the first time I saw poverty in the country. You really have to go away, out of India, to come and appreciate the fact that we have such poverty. And so I said I must study economics. So I came back and I took, enrolled in economics. But I also studied uh, Sanskrit love poetry. And I mean, I, I could give you a real, real list of things. But the beauty of an American undergraduate education is that they don't force you from day one to major in one subject. And so, like a honeybee, I was going from flower to flower till even Harvard got worried in my third year. And they said, my dean called me and he said, son, you've got to declare a major now. And then, you know, you must take minimum courses in that major. And so I chose philosophy. Why? because I wanted to know the meaning of life. I wanted to know how to be a good person and things that we all think about. What is the what is a flourishing life? So I, I got my degree in philosophy and I uh, uh, and after Harvard uh, you can see one this Harvard experience was what? It was what my father had talked about. That I was at that point concerned with making a life. And books, why, why reinvent the wheel? Somebody's already figured it out. So you read books and you learn how different people make, made their life. And anyway, I, I got a scholarship to Oxford to do a PhD. And I came home for the summer and my mother was happy at least that she thought I would have a job at least if I did a PhD uh, in philosophy, although she was still worried uh, about it. What kind of a job with philosophy? She was asking, maybe he'll get a lecture in some small town in Roper or Jalandhar or somewhere like that. Anyway, um, that summer, one day, I asked myself, did I really want to spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought, philosophy? I said, no. I wanted a life of action. So what am I like doing going to Oxford? So I promptly wrote to Oxford to say, sorry, I'm not coming. And my mother 
worst nightmare came true. She had an unemployed son at home. And she had a nosy neighbor who used to ask her every day, Thoda bunda ki kar rea. What's your son doing? And the poor thing wouldn't know what to answer. And I could see her embarrassment. And to save her embarrassment, I looked in the paper every day and in the newspaper in the Times of India, there was an advertisement for a company that wanted trainees. And I didn't know what a trainee was, but I still applied. And so, and, and I got the and I got the job. And this was the company that made Vix Vapor Rock. And so I think they got impressed with my Harvard degree, which is why they gave somebody with a philosophy major a job. But in those days, we didn't have this MBA uh, obsession. And uh, anyway, so <clears throat> suddenly from a promising academic career in ivy-covered halls at Harvard or Oxford, I was walking the bazaars, dusty bazaars of India, going to chemist shop to chemist shop, asking, bhai, kitna lena hai? Ek dozen, do dozen. You know, so it was a very different life. And uh, while my mother felt reassured that this boy was able to make a living, uh, my father said, uh, don't worry experiments. If you don't like it, you can always do something else. And uh, and it's true. I thought this was going to be just an experiment for a few months or a few a year or so, but like the man who came to dinner, I stayed on. And so, and I began to like the rough and tumble of the business life. And, and uh, And I just relate one incident from that life because one year there was a flu and we sold a hell of a lot of Vicks Vapora during that flu. Unfortunately, this was at the time of Indira Gandhi and the license Raj. And what had we done? We had exceeded our capacity. There, you know, every company at that time had a license. And we had a license capacity to produce only so many tons of wicks. And we had produced <coughs> almost 50% more. And sure enough, a summons arrived in Delhi. I mean, from Delhi. We were in Bombay, Bombay company. And, uh, and the summons was asking me to explain uh, why we had broken the law. So I arrived there and there was a three year jail sentence for disobeying, for breaking the law. And so it's a, you can imagine this is a joint secretary sitting there. He, he make, wants to make an example of, of us. So he keeps me waiting for two hours outside his office. And then when I have two lawyers from Crawford Bailey on each side, and we are, uh, finally we are taken into his room, and he um, he's reading the paper. He doesn't look, we've just sat down, he doesn't look at us, keeps reading the paper. And <clears throat> then I go like this, <clears throat> to remind him that we are sitting there, and he looks at me and uh, he says, Kya? What do you want? I said, uh, Sir, you have asked me here. So you tell me. And he says, No, no, kya kya hai? Finally, they got me. And I said, Well, this is what happened. We produced a lot of wicks. It was beyond our capacity, uh, licensed capacity. And uh, we thought we had done a good job because we kept the pharmacy shelves stocked during a pandemic and uh, brought a lot of um, 
I mean, a relief to children and less anxiety for mothers during this uh, epidemic. And he says, yes, but you've broken the law. I said, yes, that's true. And he said, you know, I don't, you, you guys are all crooks in the business world, especially you multinational companies. We were an American multinational. He was a Marxist and a true believer in the license right. And he said, look, I'm sorry, you've broken the law. Now the law will take its own course. So there was no sympathy on his side. And the lawyers were shivering on both sides. And we, and he said, jow, jow, you know, throwing us out of his office. And just as I was leaving, I turned around. I don't know what got into me. And I said, sir, what if this news goes out? And it will, because we are an international company. It's not every day that you send an executive of a multinational company to jail anywhere in the world. And what do you think our country will look like when people read that here's a company that produced a product which was needed by millions of people and <coughs> And the result of it is you put the guy in jail. So he says, are you threatening me? I said, no, I'm just telling you, I'm not going to leak it, leak it out, but it will go out, the news will get out. <coughs> and it will appear in the New York Times, Washington Post, or the papers in the world. And he got, an, he got, he frowned and he said, jow, jow. Anyway, I had a, a number of sleepless nights after that, knowing when I'll be going to jail. But <coughs> the government dropped the inquiry. Anyway, this is a this is not so much about making a life that I. It's more to tell you what <coughs> operate how lucky you are, young people, that you are not operating in the license raj. This is what it was like. It was a madness, lunacy. And just what they did two weeks ago in Delhi, by the way, they put computers under licensing. I don't know whether you know. Read the Tomorrow's Times of India. I have written an article on the editorial page about <coughs> it. But this is, we lived under that lunacy for all these uh, years. Anyway, fast forward. At 37, I become the CEO of the company where I started and then that company is bought worldwide by Procter & Gamble. So we become Procter & Gamble India and, 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 and one fine day, uh, I'm by now at the world headquarters and uh, uh, there's a meeting of a global meeting of the team that runs Pampers, a product that we make, PNG makes. And, uh, and the news had just come that morning on the radio, uh, as I heard it on, in the car coming to work, that India's economic reforms were in trouble. This is 1994. Narsimha Rao has, is under great attack by the left wing, by the left, especially the left of the Congress party. And, it's, and, and, and so there's a fear in the country that the reforms might be undone. And so I, got, I was thinking about that and I said, oh my God. And when I'm at this Pampers meeting, I said, what the hell am I doing? Talking about Pampers in Africa and Asia and Europe and all that. I mean, good product. But here's history being undone in India and what am I doing? Anyway, that's when I quit the, my job in the company. I came back. I then became a kind of cheerleader for the reforms. I started writing a column. I became a full-time writer. What I haven't told you is that in between 
there were days when I used to ask myself, what am I doing, even earlier. Uh, I was, uh, because I, st I missed the intellectual life of the university. And, um, and so my father actually had said that, look, you have your weekends. Do something else over the weekend. And so I began to write over the weekend. In fact, one morning, I was 22 years old, and I uh, said to myself that it must be a morning like this when Shakespeare sat down to write Hamlet. And I sat down to write my first play called Laran Sahab, which luckily won a big prize, and then it was performed. Uh, and then it also uh, was uh, done by BBC and all that. So it, I, I sort of started a second career on the weekend. And I had a second play called Mira, based on Mirabai, where the new producers in New York converted Mira Bhajans to rock music, became a rock musical, and did, well, did well in New York. So <clears throat> I had this second career which had got started. So when I quit my corporate life, um, I had I could fall back on something that I had written a novel. I see those books are there, the plays and the novels also at the back. And the fact is that um, I had almost prepared myself for a second career. And that was writing. And luckily, I had the confidence because the plays had done well. The novel, A Fine Family, had done well. And uh, anyway, that was my story. I'm just checking the time to see whether we have time for the two other stories. But the lesson, frankly, from this story is somebody is going to drop those cameras. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Those poor guys must be having a heart attack. Look at it. Oh my God. Okay. So the cameras have survived. So, um, what what is the story that I have quickly told you before I tell you the other stories? Right. The one is that the, that my life had this double theme thanks to my mother and my father. I had a father who had thought, thought, thought differently. And, and encouraged me to take some risks in life and never really told me, in fact told my mother not to be too obsessed with making a life. So I had a making a life, make, making a living, making a life. And so I had made a living and I had made a living to the point where I had, where we had a nest egg. When I was 50 I quit. We had a nest egg so that we could live. My wife was horrified that the monthly checks would not come anymore. And so she wasn't sure whether this was a good decision, but she was a good sport. And so we came back to India. <coughs> so um, the, 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 the other point here, or maybe, you know, before I draw the lessons of, uh, that I'm going to draw, um, let me move quickly to the second story. Because then I'll integrate the 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 the, 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 the whole the, the whole business. So the second story is a person, Kamle. Kamle made his life at his job. In other words, I think from the day that he arrived. You could tell that he was different. He didn't know English, but he had a fascination for anything 
that he did not understand, like technology. First day he spotted the tea making and coffee making machine in our office. And he got so fascinated, he learned to make it. And then because he had made coffee and tea, he would go and offer it to people. So while he was doing his security round, he came for the evening shift. He came at 5.30 in the evenings when the office closed and people stayed on and, uh, and, and to those who stayed on, he was experimenting with, he was, a, he was like a child. He was like a child who had found a toy. Next day he found the telex machine. Those days we sent telexes to each other. And he didn't know English, but he was fascinated with this, how this telex machine worked. So that he then taught himself English during the, he was a night shift guard. So at daytime, he took a course in English and after a six weeks to a month or so, he had learned some English and he started sending telex messages. First he sent telex messages to himself to make sure. And then he was sending these telex messages. And so, just like, he was like a child. You know what a child does? If when it's raining, all the adults will carry an umbrella, and there's a puddle on the road, and the adults will carefully go around the puddle. Child goes, jumps into the puddle to see what it feels like. But that's what Kamde was. That he had this tremendous curiosity, but also, as he loved his job. I think he would have paid us for to come to work every day if if if, uh, if it came to that. So they had these. So one was he loved his job. Third, he was hungry, hungry for some, you know, to do something. So and and uh, the, the the fourth quality about him was a sense, a, a, a sense of basic integrity. I mean, he found one day, and one of the managers, senior managers, had dropped his wallet outside the men's room. And <clears throat> it had a lot of money in it. And so he comes to me, and he says, Sir, you have a lot of And he says, I have seen it he ID hai uska uh, manager ka to usko to pareshani hogi ki paisa itna kho diya so he said he told he gave me the keys of the office and he said now you be the security guard for one hour I'll go to Bandra and I will deliver this in a taxi and he says, by the way, give me 10 rupees. Those days, 10 rupees was enough to get a taxi. Uh, and so I gave him 10 chips and he went. And it was a lot of money because this manager was putting an advance for a flat. So it was like lakhs of rupees were in that. And he had gone to the bank to draw the money out to pay the advance. and the seller was coming right that evening. So I arrived, I mean, Kamble arrived just a few minutes before the seller came in. And you can never, you can't imagine the relief that the husband and wife had when they saw Kamble with the wallet. But the other thing that he told them, don't tell anyone that I delivered this wallet. And he also told me, and why? Because I think he never wanted to sort of, he, he, had, a, he had a modesty, a basic self-effacing modesty. He didn't want people to think, ah, Kamle ne ye kiya hai. In other words, he's the type of person we all of us meet this sort of, it's very rare by the way, we meet a person who doesn't care who gets the credit. You know, he works in a team, that's such a person, she works in a team, but doesn't really want a credit. Anyway, um, 
a few months later. I think Kamli had been there for about five, six months and he had already established a formidable reputation for, if anything was in the evening shift, if you needed anything, you said, ask Kamli. He would, by then he was able also, uh, he knew how to do that. Uh, you know, we had a EPBX. I mean, those days we used to have a big, huge, you know, you put wires in mm. to get telephone calls connected, so he was answering phones. So our telephone operator during the day shift was going to have a baby. So she was going on maternity leave for a few months. So Kamle went to the head of personnel and he said to him, look, um, give me a chance. I'm tired of working at night. I'll be your temporary telephone operator until she comes back. And then I'll go back to my job. And that guy says, Kamle, we are a multinational company. We get calls from around the world. You don't know English. How can we give you this job? Bichara Kamle, he goes off with a long face. But I hear through the grapevine about what Kamle has uh, wanted. And so I asked, I told the personnel guy, I said, look, give him a chance. Let's try him out for a few days, have a backup ready. And if he doesn't work out, take it, we'll give the job to someone else. So the personnel guy reluctantly agrees. And so next morning I'm sitting, I'm seeing Kamle sitting at the booth, telephone booth for Tata. And you know, with, it, with all these wires that you have to push in. And after two days, the lawyer, company's lawyer, Crawford Bailey, Mr. Sharp, came, came in and he asked me, by the way, good children, do you have a new EPPX system? I said, no. He said, well, uh, you know, before, it, your phones used to ring four, five times before it was answered. And now, it's promptly picked up on the second ring. So what is your, what's the secret? And I said, Kamle. <laughs> and so I asked Kamle, after Mr. Shah left, I was, you know, when I was going home in the evening, I said, Kamle, why do you answer the phone so quickly? And he gave me an answer that devastated me. He said, there may be a customer on the other side, Amrutanjan or somebody, you know, uh, halls or whatever product are competitive, we were competing against. Uh, he said, I don't want you to lose an order. I bet you our head of marketing couldn't have answered that question so well. So this is what Kamli was like. He instinctively understood who paid his salary. It was the customer. He had done no MBA, nothing, but instinctively the guy Anyway, I, I could go on. All I can tell you is that this the company recognized that they had somebody unusual. And so he kept getting promoted. Every few years he'd get promoted until he retired as a director of the company. So now, since time is running out, we won't have time for the third story. But, well, you know, uh, let me take these two stories. And if you still want to hear the third one, I'll quickly tell you the third one. But the story, Kamala's story, my story, they tell you a few things. One of these is that, um, you know, that, that before I talk about the lessons, but what is happiness? And I think that uh, Kamle had figured out, happiness, I've always believed, is a very one-line answer. Happiness is to love the work you do 
and love the person you live with. End of story. And frankly, both Kamle and I figured out that <coughs> we love to do what we did. Now, Kamle loved being in the office, loved to do everything. He made everything into a game. By the way, this is unusual because they did a study in, a, in England with people, working people, both white collar and blue collar <coughs> workers. And the study showed that 70% of people were bored at their jobs. They didn't like their work. So Kamala is very unusual. The second thing was that in Kamala, in my case, I, my work was fine, but, and I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. What I loved was actually writing. I discovered, because I took my hobby seriously, it became a kind of second occupation. And, and how does one know that one loves one's work? Because time gets distorted. In other words, you say, oh my God, it's already 12 o'clock. I thought it was just 10.30. So for one and a half hours, you lost. You lost that one and a half hours. Now, that is one symptom of knowing. In the idea, there's a psychologist from the University of Chicago who studied this. And he calls it flow. That when you are so absorbed in something you love, that you, time, you forget. And of course, in the last 25 years, I've been a writer. So I've experienced it. But I've experienced it even earlier, that in, in my writing, I, I write every day from 6 to 12. It's almost like a magnet being pulled from my bedroom to my study. And suddenly, I'm on the computer, and lines are appearing, sentences are appearing on the screen, and I don't even know that I am there. So the other symptom is that you forget yourself. Time gets distorted, you forget yourself, and this is the notion of flow. So both Kamle had that ability where he was in the flow, and I found that when I was writing. So this is a tip for you, that if you really love your work, this is the state you want to, um, you want to uh, strive towards. And then <clears throat> the idea that we are talking about is to live an examined life, meaning that most of us just, you know, get up in the morning and do what we have to do and we don't really think about this. As I was saying, we sort of sleepwalk through life. Uh, and, and, and then when we realize it, we, it's sometimes too late, you know. And, and, and so this is a second quality, I think. The other is that, you know, we are constantly reminded about our duty. Duty means duty to others, generally. But we forget we also have a duty to ourselves. And we are, in fact, we, are, we feel a little guilty if we are too selfish or think too much of ourselves. But actually, it's, it's healthy. It's, 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 it's healthy to to realize that you have a duty to yourself. A fourth, fourth lesson, I think, from this two story, but certainly from my story, is that when I forgot my mother's advice and I followed my father's advice in college, and when I discovered all these riches of books, the liberal education, as it's called, the 
in India, of course, you, if, if somebody doesn't get good marks, you know, then you go to study arts. You know, otherwise you go to science or commerce. You do arts. Well, I tell you the purpose of a university is to teach you to make a life. And engineering and medicine and law will help you find a job, but they won't prepare you to make a life. But if you read literature, you read history, you read philosophy, that will help you to make a life. And go home, Google 100 great books. This was a special program created by a, a great educationist in America. And the liberal education that's taught in undergraduates in America is based on these hundred great books. In fact, there are colleges in America, St. John's, which only, you're only expected to read hundred books in those four years, and you can graduate after that. So this notion of books and reading of books is also, because why do you want to reinvent the wheel? Somebody has figured out the answer already, and just read it. And the other lesson, of course, is that my father's advice was to take a little bit of risk with your life. You know, if you want to make a life, of course, I took it too far. You know, quitting at the top, I mean, when I was in a promising academic career, I left it to walk the bazaars of India. But, <clears throat> or quitting at the top of my career at the corporate world, these were risks. And, but they were sort of calculated risks, meaning that I had already experienced success as a writer before I took that risk. And uh, <clears throat> then I think another quality which both Kamble and I had was restlessness. A little bit of discontent with everything, you know, a little bit of discontent. And that I think is helpful. Helpful to take those risks. But if you're too comfortable, you won't you won't take the risks. And, and, and then, finally, the role of pleasure. You know, we are told to do our duty and all that. And they make us feel, our teachers, parents, that life is a drudgery, frankly. And <coughs> the idea that there should be pleasure in your life. That's why I wrote a book on the, called The Riddle of Desire, Karma. And that's about pleasure. And that's a very important part of, of, of life. Anyway, <coughs> we have, uh, it's now, I think, 12 noon. And I haven't left time for questions for you all. And so we should devote 15 minutes or so to questions. And if you have the time, Seven minutes extra, I'll tell you the story of the mouse merchant. What do you say? Yes. yes. Okay, mouse merchant. The president is not arriving before three fifty. Okay, so we can breathe easy. Um, 12th century Sanskrit text. There was a story. It's a story of a young man who reaches the age of 17 and his mother, is, his father is not alive anymore. His mother brings him up. She cleans houses of homes and it is on, it is, your phone is ringing, uh, blipping, okay. Um, she cleans homes. And she tells him, look, you have a destiny. You're not going to do what I have done. 
So you're going to make a life. And she says, go to that house over there. The richest man in our town lives there. And he's supposed to be a kind man. And go and stand outside his house. And when he comes out, ask him. Ask him what you should be doing. And so this boy dutifully goes the next morning to that house, big haveli, and he's waiting outside in the courtyard when he sees a dead mouse. And when the grand personage man comes out, this boy asks him, can I have that dead mouse? And the man is shocked. He says, is that all you want? And the boy says, yes. But he says, look, people come to me for jobs, for money, and you just want, you're doing me a favor. Take the dead mouse. But what else do you want? The boy says, no, I don't want anything else. I'll just take the dead mouse. So this boy takes the dead mouse. He knows there's a widow. If there's a widow in a house nearby who has a cat. So he sells the mouse for a few paisa. She gives him as cat food. Cat food for the widow. He takes the paisa, goes to the bazaar, buys some chana. And with those chana, he makes furiyas, he makes little packets, and takes a ghara of water, and he goes and sits in the town square under a tree. He knows that in the afternoon, loggers come from the forest, carrying logs of wood on their heads. And they always rest there at the, at the town square. So they arrive, and this boy offers chana and water to each one, and they're all very happy, but they don't have money. So each one gives him a log of wood. Next day he sells a log, gets nicer quality chana with spices and all, makes nicer puriyas out of it, and <coughs> takes, this time he puts a little ice in the water, cold water, and he goes back in the town square. <coughs> and they are delighted. And again they give him one log each. And he does this for three months. Then the monsoons come, the rains come, the logging in the forest stops. And the price of timber starts climbing up. And this boy has a house full of logs. And he starts unloading his logs slowly in the market. And by the end of the season, he has made a killing. And he has enough money to buy a shop in the timber market. So he established himself at the age of 17 and a half as a timber merchant. And he has one competitive advantage over the others, other competitors in the market. The loggers know him and they like him because he helped them out. So they all go to him first with their logs. This quality he buys Anyway, he, two years, he's a success. And then he notices that actually the margin in selling wood is not as much as if you converted those wood, wooden logs into a ship and sold ships. So he finds a shipbuilder, carpenter, who's a master shipbuilder. So he tells that fellow, I'll finance you, let's go into business, and we'll make a ship, and I'll provide the capital, and you provide the uh, ability. And sure enough, they, he, he's making a ships now in his second company. He has a subsidiary, a ship making subsidiary. And uh, he does well. Then he discovers that actually there's a margin, there's more money
to be made in transporting people in ship people or cargo in ships than in selling ships so he finds a a uh, retired captain a ship captain and uh, he tells him i'll finance you you provide the skill you do the ship running and uh, so he has got three businesses now and by 25 and that also is successful by 25 he is the richest man in town this young boy and he goes to a jeweler and he asks the jeweler to make him a gold mouse so the jeweler makes him this 24 carat gold mouse and he takes this to the richest man in town and presents it to him as this is in today's language he says this is your returns for venture capital that you provided me with for the dead mouse <laughs> and the old man the rich man is so happy to hear this story he gives his daughter in marriage to this young man <laughs> so here is another story of somebody who made a life he made a life he took risks and <clears throat> his was a life of flow you can imagine not one second did he have to feel bored with life so now <clears throat> I think I should end there. You've heard three stories of making a life, and you you can draw your other lessons from it.